Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight influential people in Howard culture that are making moves. Today, we got a special guest, man. We up in the morning. It's my earliest, it's the earliest I've ever got up for an interview. But I had to get this dude on, man. I had to get on his schedule. Man, this, you can hear this dude on CNN, MSNBC. You can read him on The Root, Ebony.com, Huffington Post. He's a civil rights op- attorney, two-time Howard graduate, went to Howard Law. His brother specialized in human resources, human capital solutions, diversity and inclusion. A former Brooklyn, New York prosecutor turned civil uh, legislator, a trial lawyer, civic activism. This brother has bars. Yo, he had bars at Howard, though. He had, I want to see if you could hit, you know, give us a little freestyle, Charles. But uh, this man got, got bars for days. If you um go on YouTube and check out his reel, he's giving folks the business. You know what I'm saying? That verbal Armageddon taught him something. But ladies and gentlemen, man, my fellow campus pal, member of Omega Sci-Fi, Charles Coleman, former undergrad trustee. Undergrad trustee and grad trustee. Oh, damn, bro. You uh, you petty. You selfish, bro. Come on, man. Exclusive club. Yo, what's, <coughs> up? what's up, bro? What's going on, Josh, man? Um, shout out to HU Movemakers, you know, the Price and Stampede in the building. Uh, always, always, always good uh, to be among friends who you've known for like 20 years, man. This is a blessing. Um, I want to first and foremost thank you for uh, everything that you do with HU Movemakers. It's very, very big for Howard culture. Um, We're everywhere, as you already know. And to see someone not only from my era, um, but also someone who is just as passionate about Howard and contributing to the culture and supporting the culture, doing what you do is uh, amazing. So I wanna say thank you for that. and. um, also, thank you for having me. I mean, real talk, like, because when you, it, it, it's different. I always tell people this. It's different when people from Howard recognize you doing dope stuff because it's a lot of us doing dope stuff. And so dopeness becomes the norm, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not that anybody is taking away from your credibility or from, the, you know, your credentials or from them being hot. It's just that if you look around, everybody that we know from school is, you know, making moves, people writing books, people on TV, people doing this and that. So at a point, it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you be doing dope shit? We all do dope shit. So it's like, you know, to, to, to be recognized among that is very, very significant. So I want to thank you for having me. Um, and, 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 and again, thank you for everything you do for Howard University and the culture with this and with HU Movemakers and everything else that you have going on, just as a whole movement, man. It's really, really dope. And uh, as someone who has known you since you literally came into Howard, yeah. uh, it makes me extremely proud. Yeah, man, I, I remember, and thank you for that, man. I, I remember when I got to campus, I was, it was me and my mom, and uh, we bought the Pal Pack. And I remember you came up to my mind. You was like, yo, everybody buys the power pack. Everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. I think it was like 40 bucks at the time. And so my mom was like, I bet. And it was like, from then on, man, it was, it was history, bro. That's it was straight up. history, man. That's but yeah, thank you for coming on the show, man. I certainly appreciate it. You know, it's, it's dope, man, because when I, you know, obviously you can't help but to follow politics these days, mm-hmm. man, with, with everything that's going on with, you know, injustices and, Trump being in office, it's just such a hot button clickbait topic, whether you're on social media or in a bed at night, flipping between CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. You're just trying to get all these perspectives. And it's dope when I see my man's on there representing like, yo, time out. <laughs> Pause, <laughs> you know what I'm Let me educate you on what's going down, man. I, I really like how you uh, represent because it's – uh. You know, and, and when I when I hear you talking, I'm like, yo, that's the same dude that was like, you know, at Verbal Armageddon, rapping, Campus no Pal, Variety no Show, doubt. rapping. But it's like, 
it just goes to show like how you was grooming yourself for this moment. It's the same dude that went from rapping to like running for trustee and running campaigns and you know, you know Howard, man. It's it's no doubt. political, bro. It's it's but it is. You gotta learn how to move, man. <laughs> the versatility piece is, is is everything. And I think that um Howard as a grooming ground, you know, in general just forces a certain type of 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 you know versatility and tightness out of you like the 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 expectations are just different from from you if if you really want to step into that space meaning meaning the space of seeming seeming to be an authority or an expert or somebody in this the opportunity is there right but you have to have the substance to go with it howard is not one of those places that really grooms people that are like low on substance um but then high on flash like you have to have both you have to be able to navigate you know all of those those all of those points on the spectrum and so and that's a huge blessing in terms of what howard you know did for me and i'm thankful for it like intensely thankful for it because it does it definitely does serve me bro i i see you kind of <coughs> in your moments like yeah i'll be watching I, you like you be you, be, you be like oh i was hoping you would ask me that question yeah man <laughs> I mean, like when you, i'll be seeing you like especially damn. especially around social justice right because you know um for me I'm a big person around narrative control. I started doing media around social justice and criminal justice back in 2013. That was like sort of my, you know, debut where I went from writing because I was writing a lot about criminal justice and social justice at the time around 2011, 2012. And then I got an opportunity to do um, Hot 97, which is, you know, a very big hip hop station here in New York. Is and that with, um, uh, Rosenberg, is that is that? The- I did Rosenberg. I didn't do Rosenberg. That that's his show. That's his show. But I I did. Uh, I mean, that's his station. Well, Ebro. I didn't, do, I didn't do Ebro and Rosenberg's show until years later. But I was doing Street Soldiers, which was like their one actual like substantive content show. Matter of fact, at that time, believe it or not, Rosenberg and Ebro like they, their show wasn't as big as it is now at all so i did street soldiers and i did it literally the the zimmerman verdict came down on a saturday um and i i'm yeah the zimmerman verdict came down on a saturday and i did i did uh street soldiers literally the next morning and when i did it um people kept asking me like yo how could this happen how did this go so on and so forth and we won, you know, we had a big conversation about staying your ground and all of that. And I think on a certain level, staying your ground is def- definitely a relevant part of what that conversation was. But on a bigger level, um, I've always said those prosecutors lost that case because they lost control of the narrative. And, you know, people ask me, what do I mean? And I say, well, they lost control of the narrative when the conversation became more about whether Trayvon Martin should have had on a hoodie or whether he previously smoked weed or what type of language he used previously in describing white people. Uh, then it did. Cause what, how, how old was, how old was Trayvon Martin when he got he was 17 years, when he, 17 years old when he got murdered. He's 17, man. And I feel like in that scenario, he would have did what any father would have told him to do in that situation. Absolutely right. You know, I mean, defend yourself. Right. Defend yourself, right? And so, you know, you felt threatened. The natural, the you know, the natural sort of question when you feel threatened is fight or flight, right? Like that's the the natural question. You're gonna you're either gonna run to avoid what you know you you perceive as a threat, or you're gonna defend yourself against what you perceive to be the threat. So, you know, you're right. And since that time, that's sort of been the theme of my work. Whether it's um, on TV, having conversation, whether it's, uh, you know, my brand, Black Brilliance, whether it's the web series that I do around Black manhood, Black Brilliance, Black Brilliance 360, all of those things thematically are about creating and owning our own narrative. Because I'm a big believer that in 2020, um, freedom for people in America, for Black people in America, is the ability to create and to actualize any narrative as you see fit. Whatever narrative that you believe, you know, you want to attach yourself to, being able to create that and actualize that is my definition of freedom. 
in 2020. So a lot of the work that I do is centered around that. So when I go on television, media controls a lot of narratives. So when I get on TV and they ask me a question, you right, I'm ready to light, I'm ready to light it up because I'm like, yo, this is the platform that I can push a different narrative than the one that's being, you know, supported and, and promoted throughout, you know, different media. And in times like these around social justice, it's really important. Um, and so, yeah, I do light up because I get a chance to reframe narratives. Like there are all kinds of wacky false narratives are up there around, you know, we should be talking about black on black crime. We should be talking about, uh, you know, why defunding the police will never work. Just, you know, all of these things, right? And so it's a, in, incumbent upon me when I have the mic, you know what I'm saying, to be like, all right, so like you said, time out. This is how we're going to reframe this. This is how we're going to look at this differently. This is how we are yeah, going to... I, I, I saw one of your clips, man, and you was like... Uh, I mean, dude, dude was like, well, he was like, well, Charles, well, I mean, do you feel like threatened from the police? And you was like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I don't, I don't wear a suit every day. You know, mm -hmm. I dress just like this dude, you know what I'm saying? And I think for, for some, I think for a lot of white people who really don't have that type of exposure to black people, if they see a black person in a hoodie, they see a thug, they, they, they can't really, they don't, they look at us as one and the same. They don't really right. understand like, this is how we dress, you know, culturally. It doesn't mean I'm about to stick you up. It's just as, you know, like when we right. was, remember we was at Howard, everybody was wearing white tees and, you know, you know, Timberland, like that, that's our whole culture. Everybody had braids. It didn't mean anything, man. It didn't mean that we was going to be bad people. But I, I think you, you make a good point with that, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I think for a lot of folks, right, it's important that they understand that these things don't happen in a vacuum because it's easy for you to sit in a studio with me and like think about, oh, well, he speaks so well and you know, he's a two time Howard University graduate. You know, he would never have to worry about XYZ. I've never had a cop ask me where I went to school when he pulls me over. I've never had a police officer ask me how many degrees I have when I get pulled over. Right. right. So <laughs> a lot of times the context that we have around these conversations can unfortunately influence people to sort of get more comfortable in thinking like, oh, this is not an issue with them. They, they good. And it's like, no, I'm actually not. I'm not any different. And the circumstances are no different. And we've seen that. Right. We've seen state legislators. We've seen. Uh, in Florida, the attorney general got pulled over. Like, we've seen all kinds of, you know, who's a black woman um, got pulled over for nothing. Like, and then homeboy, you know, had to take that L. You know what I'm saying? Like, we've seen this on a number of different levels. So it's very important from a narrative standpoint that I am clear in letting people know, hey, yo, this does not discriminate. You know, racism does not discriminate against the the educated versus the uneducated the suits versus the sh the shirts versus the no pants right <laughs> right and like you well, know Kanye said you you still a nigga in the coop in a suit <laughs> in the coop right that's right and it shit you know what I'm saying at the end of the day right like it shouldn't have to right because and I, and I just had this conversation there was a there was a um a rally that was done in Omaha Nebraska recently where some brothers got together and they put on nice clothes and they wore suits and they went for a rally and they, they, their, their sort of mantra was, or their message was, we're dressing nice because we want to change the narrative. And there's been so many different marches going on across the country where, you know, we said we were, you know, we're going to do something different and, and, and be viewed different. And so we we're going to change the narrative. And my problem with that was, yo, by even approaching it in that way, it puts the onus of responsibility on the wrong party yeah. in terms of changing how people see us. Like, oh, man, if we just dress better, folks would stop shooting us. No, that's that's that's. That's a problem, right? So like anytime I have an opportunity to correct the narrative, to change the narrative, to make the narrative more accurate, I'm with it. That's what I do. 
Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. No, that makes sense, man. You know, when I think about that Trayvon case, man, I'm like, how do you lose a case like that? And I know we don't have a bunch of time. We could talk about that. That's a yeah. whole episode in and of itself. But when I think about you know, <coughs> George Zimmerman calling in, the police saying, or the operator saying, stand down, don't pursue him. When I hear they got him on tape saying, they always get away. Then, you know, he pursues him. Trayvon is just walking to his crib. You know, whether he's smoking weed or not or whatever, it has nothing to do with anything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they get in a tussle, I guess, Trayvon is winning the tussle. Zimmerman, quote, unquote, fears for his life, kills Trayvon Martin. Now you get him on trial, and it's like, I guess they get to paint this, paint this image of, well, he had it coming or he deserved to die. And then they put his homegirl on the, on the stand who is not the best speaker and whatnot. So, you know, it just paints a picture of a, a, a person that, like, that they really didn't have a valuable life, man. And and to me, like, I, I like how does how does that happen, man? I mean, it's like as a lawyer, I mean, you're a prosecutor. You know, how do you lose a case? It, it, to me, it don't even seem like you got to be an expert at law to lose a case like that. You know, how so, does that happen? So I think you know again, um, my where we start from a big picture piece right, is that the prosecutors in the case lost control of the narrative. The, the case, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're at trial, um, you have to always be mindful of making sure the jury understands what this case is about. And so I think on a big picture level, the prosecutor lost control of the narrative because they focused in entirely too much on the weeds and not the forest. So people, you know, got distracted by like, oh, well, this one weed or this other weed over here or stay in your ground or what have you without sort of basically saying that, you know, at the end of the day, look, a 17 year old young man has lost his life. We know who killed them. Are you going to hold that person responsible or not? Right. Like, I also think there are a couple other big picture issues that we have to consider that we didn't necessarily look at then the way we do now. Um, Trayvon Martin was very important. It was important because it began a conversation that has taken um, almost seven years to come to a crescendo, and that, you know, eight years to come to a crescendo, and that is the conversation about um, how black life is undervalued in America. Uh, at that point, I think that a number of uh, folks white people and black people did not understand the extent of this conversation, nor were they acquainted with the dynamics around it, right? Because, I mean, I myself at that time, to be honest with you, I cringe every time I think about this, but this is a true story. I remember I thought I was so profound and I was thought I was so woke. I wrote a, um, a Facebook status during the trial and I was like, you know, we all upset about Zimmerman, but we don't realize that we have George Zimmermans that walk around our community who look like us every day. And I thought that that was like, yeah, I'm saying something. And I remember a sister got in my, my DMs and she lit me up about that statement and just how inappropriate it was at that time and why it was wrong. And it took me a minute to understand that. But again, that's just one example of how our dialogue at that point just wasn't, it wasn't as sophisticated as it needed to be. But it opened up a conversation. It opened up a conversation about jury duty, about the need to show up for jury duty. The jury in the Trayvon Martin trial should have been more reflective of the community and it should have had more black people on that jury, right? We've seen a number of other miscarriages of justice, which is why I've talked about very publicly the need, as a prosecutor, I can tell you, when we have jury duty, and you're, you're, you're as a former prosecutor, when you're choosing a jury and you're going through that, that process, and you look at the jury box, you look at the black people on the jury, most of the time they're trying to get out of jury. Duty. 
most of the time. And I get it. I understand why, right? Like, it can be a bore. It can be a drag. It's not always the most exciting thing. You're away from work. You got life. It's, 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 it's seen as an inconvenience. And I understand that. But here's the thing, right? Nobody's going to tell you, for the most part, when you get the jury duty notice, nobody's going to tell you, yo, this is the George Zimmerman trial you're showing up for. Yo, this is the George, George Floyd trial you're showing up for. Yo, this is the Breonna Taylor trial you're showing up for. Right? Nobody's going to tell you that. So it's important that you, you know what I'm saying, honor those, those messages when they come. And that's, you know, that's just another example of how this perfect storm of different things can combine for a Zimmerman acquittal in that instance. But also the silver lining to that cloud is that that will always be looked at as the moment, even before Mike Brown and Ferguson, Trayvon Martin will always be the name that set off the conversation that led to so many different things that are happening now and continuing to happening around movement spaces. Yeah, no, that's real, man. <clears throat> I want to transition, man, to something that was, uh, it was on your bio, man. I mean, you got a, 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 a bunch of dope stuff on there, but something that really stood out to me, I'm going to read it. It's uh, okay. the diversity myth, man, how race keeps getting left out. And, I, and this resonated with me. It says, while on the surface, that seems to be a good thing. The more diversity is stressed, the more it seems like that race keeps getting excluded from the conversation. Ironic, given that the emphasis on diversity was typically intended to provide access to racial minorities, often excluded from certain spaces. So how do we get here and how do we correct it? Um, good one. I mean, you know, I've had conversations with around this with, with a lot of homies, man, and they like, man, you know, black people will start a movement and then somebody else, another alleged minority will benefit from it. You know, I'll let you take it from there. Like what, you know. Yeah, man, this is, this is a very controversial, you know, it's a very controversial um, conversation because as you just alluded to, we have historically seen our movements co-opted and hijacked by people who they weren't initially intended to benefit. And we sort of get, we're the only race that sort of gets put in the awkward position of either having to be outright disrespectful and telling people like, no, this is not your space, or continuously compromising what it is that our space is intended for in order to accommodate the comfortability of other groups. And when I use that, when I do that talk, um, that's a talk that I do. Uh, and, and one of the talk, one of the points that I make is, you know, all of these victories in civil rights were won on the backs of black people who literally put their lives at risk in order to secure um, certain things for our community for generations to come. When that happened, the folks who were trying to come around now, they weren't nowhere to be found. They weren't at the table. They weren't, you know, putting the, the in, in, in the numbers that they are now. They weren't at the table. They weren't, you know, generally speaking, putting their lives on the line in order to create change and to affect, you know, progress. Um, they may have had good hearts and good intentions, but they weren't necessarily taking the same risk that we were taking. You know, of course, I'm not uh, ignorant to the fact that, you know, the NAACP was in part founded with the assistance and support of a number of Jewish friends, or that there were a number of white college kids who participated in the Freedom Rides in the <clears throat> 60s. I'm, I'm very familiar with that history. So I don't say this in the sense of being absolute, but the bigger concern is, Oftentimes, diversity can be a weapon. It can be weaponized as, uh, in, a, in a way, as a way of silencing racial discontent. So it's, it's almost like, you know, let's use the term diversity to get away from talking about race because race makes us uncomfortable. And so when I'm talking about diversity, now I can broaden the conversation and drown race out because now I'm talking about religion, I'm talking about sexuality, I'm talking about, you know, uh, gender, 
and a bunch of other things that now are part of the conversation, which, you know, it puts black people in a position because we're like, well, I mean, I don't want to say that I'm, I don't want, it, it, it sounds bad for me to say that I don't want to talk about um, illegal immigrants or uh, the queer community or, uh, you know, Muslims or Islamophobia. Like you don't want to say that because then you, you get labeled a bigot. But the effect is the conversation never really gets to race and that continuously gets skipped over, but it's okay because we were talking about diversity. So that's a really big challenge that a lot of people face um, in a number of different envi environments. A lot of corporate environments, for example, you know, they will do everything they can. And, you know, it, it's, it's proven that white women are the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action than any other ethnic group or demographic. <laughs> That's crazy. I remember the first time hearing that stat when I was like in college or something. I was like, what? Right. And it like, sounds crazy. <laughs> if you yeah. know what it was created for and intended for, it bugs you out. Like, are you nuts? Right. But then it makes sense because, you know, Trump got like majority of white women voted for Donald Trump and yeah. he was running against a white woman, Hillary Clinton. So right. it, you know, it, 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 it makes a hundred percent sense, man. A few weeks ago, talking about reparations. And I mean, this has always been something that has been mentioned, but it hasn't been a, ever been a real conversation, at least not in my mind. Um, so people talk about it as a dollar amount. People talk about it as, you know, opportunities or loans with no interest. I mean, do you believe that black folks should receive reparations? Absolutely, unapologetically, <laughs> unequivocally. Give us all of it. What does it. that look like, yo? So Charles Coleman is in charge of reparations. What does that look like in terms of what we receive? So, you know, I think that um, it has to be something that is exclusive to us, uh, you know, meaning that we don't want a tax break that everybody else sort of gets or a version of a tax break that everybody gets, right? Um, at the end of the day, and this is one example, at the end of the day, um, I think that this is an issue that needs to be studied in terms of uh, economically, uh, what makes the most sense, uh, what has the highest capital, um, and what is meaningful. Typically in the past, reparations has come for different groups in a number of different forms, uh, Jews in Germany eventually, um, as well as in the United States even, where they received reparations uh, for, crime, for crimes against humanity that were committed against them, as well as uh, Japanese Americans in the United States. They also received um, a form of reparations. Both of those were economic, primarily. Um, I think that there needs to be a concrete study done on the impact of slavery, uh, generationally speaking. And then from there, once you understand the impact, you can, you know, then ascertain what the actual remedies are, right? So I, and I don't think it has to be specifically one or the other. And I, I think we do ourselves a disservice by being so definitive in terms of what it should be. I think Bob Johnson put out something that says something like 300,000 to every African-American person, you know, in the country. I wouldn't be mad at that. But I also don't know that that, you know, in and of itself pays the bill. Uh, I think that there is an economic bill that America has to black Americans that needs to be addressed and satisfied. But I also think that there's a bill of intangibles and psychological uh, uh, debt that that is owed. And I don't know that that can ever be calculated. So, you know, whether it's real estate, whether it's loan forgiveness, whether it's tax bra tax breaks, whether it's, you know, everybody has a 800 credit score for the rest of their life. I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, but what I will say is that I am in very much so in favor of reparations. I think it's an important remedy that our community needs, um, our community deserves, and we should uh, be entitled to. You got some of the dopest suits. Ah! You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You got some of the dopest suit, the, the suit game, bro. Like, oh, how, how, how much you paying for them suits, Charles? That shit is hilarious, <laughs> man. Yo, man, shout out, 
<laughs> no, I try to I try to um I try to mess with uh all tailors of color. Um I've had a bunch of different, you know, personal tailors. All of them have been people of color. I get hit up all the time by white uh, you know, tailors who want to, you know, earn my business and I have to politely tell them like, nah, I keep my dollars black. Um, shout out to my tailor parish, all, all Derny. Um, he is my man. Uh, if, if you follow my Instagram or you, you see me tag him in terms of the suit game, um, parish is a beast. Uh, he has, has, I've been with him for years. So he gives me special pricing. I'll say that. Like I've been, because I'm one of his oldest customers. Like I was, I was with him. I've been rocking with Parish for like eight or nine years, and so he keeps me, keeps me like super right. That, but that's a that's that's hilarious. Because you know what's funny? People legit like hit me up and be like, "Yo, will you get your suits, brother?" And I'm like, you know, <laughs> how my man Parish, he's the dude. I don't want to say like a civil rights celebrity, but because you're so well spoken, because you know how to hit the points and get your word across. I feel like it's like, you know, it's a lot of parallels, man. Like with you, you from Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a lot of parallels with you and like Biggie. So, you know, Biggie, he was a dope rapper. Cause like I had Trace Lee on the show and I was like, I was like, what makes Biggie such a dope rapper? He was like, Biggie knows how to get his point across without you. Like in, he could use, he could say one word, that can mean like 10 words, you okay. know what I'm saying? He was like basically saying like, that's what makes Biggie so dope. And I know that when, when you on TV, you got to kind of get your, you got like a certain amount of time with like, all right, all right, Charles, so what do you think? You got to really get your word across or your message across within a certain time frame. And right. like, I, 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 I go back to the training ground of Howard, man, when you was, Campus Pals, you know how it, it was in Campus Pals, but even even with, uh, you know, being a rapper or a hip-hop head, you know, on campus, man, having them bars it's, ready. People ask me that all the time, like, <laughs> yo, how do you do that? And you're absolutely right. Like, I always refer to, I was like, yo, I've been, I, was, I was rhyming since I was like, I think I wrote my first rhyme at 12. Yo, you rolled me I mean, around, I mean, bro. You rolled me around, man. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Some skit. Lyr right, Lyricist Lounge. Yeah. Lyricist Lounge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I was like, I've been rhyming since I was 12, and then I've been rhyming in front of people since I was like 13 and 14. And so for me, that environment, like you said, oh, it seems like you thrive on, you know, the moment, the competitive, that, that's where that comes from. That's exactly where it comes from. Because I'm always looking at, like, from an intimidation standpoint, it's either going to be y'all like the crowd or me and it's never going to be me so i i sort of like <laughs> make it a competition thing and that's exactly right the same grit in terms of like needing to really focus get my thoughts out and articulate and use my words is the same thing that i was using you know back in verbal armageddon on stage i, I you know for those folks who are watching like don't 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 get <laughs> It confused. I am absolutely a verbal Armageddon Hall of Hall of Famer. I'm a three-time. Let me be clear. Every time I was in verbal Armageddon, I went to the. I, w I was a, in the final round. Be clear about that. So, <clears throat> verbal Armageddon started my sophomore year. I want to say, I believe it was my sophomore year. I was a three-time verbal Armageddon final round person, and I was a two-time verbal Armageddon final four member. Um, never, never, you know what I'm saying? I never got that chip. It was but some cats that had some bars, though. It was some cats. It was. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the competition bars, was stiff. Yeah. The competition it's... was stiff, right? I was in the first Final Four of Verbal Armageddon. The first year I was in the Final Four. So, like, you know, I'm just, you know, I said that, you know, tongue in cheek, but like, how it absolutely was in, in Verbal Armageddon. But you was, you know, what is it like? So, when I, when I think about like the young Charles who was like 19, 20, the cat that I knew, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I, I look back like, damn, this, this cat was on some, like, on, on his, <laughs> this dude was running for trustee. <laughs> Worked on Capitol Hill. La ladies, man, let's not forget that. I ain't going to put you out there. Ladies, man, 
My dude. <laughs> bars, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Giving people bars. You know, I, I remember when you first ran for trustee, I was like, yo, who does this cat think he is? <laughs> I'm like, this cat was, you're coming to power me like, hey, yeah, 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 I'll be back. <laughs> you know Y'all handle that, you do that, I'll be back. I'm going to go through this campaign. And be like, yo, this dude is uh, running. Um, Then you got, the, you know, then you doing verbal Armageddon. You like in the cypher. I'm like, yo, that's Charles doing that. Then I'm like over here, I'm I'm trying to talk to a chick. I'm like, Charles, talk to you. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, damn, man, who this dude yeah. think he is, man? So you know what's funny. Who this cat think he is, man? That's where the black superhero <laughs> came from, man. You know what I'm saying? I just, you know, versatility. Uh that's, that's what I say about it. Howard though, man. It was a time where like it you got to see the the talents that like we had it was you know because growing up at least in chicago man you was you kind of got put into boxes like oh you being put in a box yep. you're the smart the guy box. you the the thug you the rapper when i got to howard it was like i'm meeting individuals that was all of that in one you know what i'm saying that's like, a yeah. fact i went you know that, that's a fact like i went to a high school that was i went to prep school and um my high school was predominantly black i'm mean, predominantly white and I can honestly say that I didn't have, even growing up in New York, I didn't have an appreciation for uh, the diversity among black people that existed. And so when I went to Howard, it split my head wide open, right? Because like you said, I was used to, for the, even though I had a certain level of versatility, I was used to black people who kind of sort of like, if you were smart, you were just socially awkward. And if you were, you know, an athlete, that's all you did. And if you were in the music, that's all you did. Like, like you said, those boxes. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times we do that to ourselves in our community. Like we do that to ourselves where we put ourselves in boxes and don't allow for that type of expression when we should. And, um, you know, for me, when I got to Howard, I, I, I remember when I got to Howard, I had never heard of Master P. I had no idea who he was. I never heard his lyrics before. I never heard his music. Um, I don't know that I had ever heard a person from New Orleans speak, right? Like just to even hear a <laughs> New Orleans accent was like crazy. Um, I never met anybody who starts their genes, like people from Texas, like people <laughs> from Texas. Like I never seen that, right? Yo, that's and, crazy. Then, and then I also got to Howard, like right, I, I came to Howard in 97, in, in the fall of 97. And so this was like fresh off of, um east coast west coast rap beef like and so even with that when i'm meeting brothers from cali i'm like a little apprehensive like yeah i'm from new york they're from cali so on and so forth but as i just i remember like a week into it i was like yo this shit is wild because i saw so much diversity among us as a people and it was like so eye-opening and so amazing in terms of allowing different versions of blackness to exist in the same space and thrive and that's a huge thing for me in terms of a narrative that i continue to further today is like yo there's all kinds of different models of blackness and you don't have to be in a box that doesn't change your blackness it doesn't change who you are it doesn't you know these things can exist in the same space at the same time and that's just sort of how i tried to live you know you know that's what that's what i was you know what i'm saying like I felt like shit. I'm good at this. I'm gonna do this shit over here. I feel like I could do this. I'm gonna do this shit over here. I feel like I gotta do this. You know what I'm saying? And like, you know, some things I was, you know, better at than others. You know, but I wasn't <laughs> ever gonna be uh, afraid to. You was stuff. yo. You was you was cocky. You I was. was you I was. was. You was, and you like you knew it. You knew you was nice. It was. It's one thing to be cocky. <laughs> I think you had an understanding of how nice you was. Like you was like yeah. <laughs> I'm that dude. Like you was, you was if, like cocky with it. If it's one thing that, if it's one thing that I I am not proud of at, <laughs> at, at, as my career, how it's probably I was a little, yeah, I had a little bit of a head about me. You know, so, <laughs> um, you know that's youthful petulance, um, and sort of you know what I have learned since then. Thank God, is uh, the value of humility. Um, and the value of compassion. And those are things that like, and, and that's the thing also, right? I was coming straight from New York 
And that's like, you know what I'm saying? When you're from New York, there's a certain level of just natural feeling yourself that you have to have just for survival. Yeah, New York. And I was really, young. Yes, y'all were strong. Them personalities were strong. Yeah, real strong personalities, right? So even though I wasn't always the most aggressive New York dude, I still had that, like, yeah, you know, about me. Um, fortunately, that's something that, like I said, you know, it, it, like when you arrive as a freshman, well, first, what, what made you even choose Howard? You oh, know, that's a wild that. story. That's a really, really wild story, D. Um, <laughs> I was actually going to go to a small liberal arts college, I won't name it, in New England. Um, I was going to go there to play basketball. New England as and, in like the Boston area or? Yeah, in the, in the, in the Boston, okay. New Hampshire area, all up there. Um, I was going there to play ball. And um, I, uh, I um, got into some trouble my senior year. Uh, it wasn't even, a, it wasn't anything big. It was just, it was, like today it would be like very, very minor. But the politics of it at the time seemed like a really big deal. And so the school that I had already been accepted to been decided, like this was like, I'm talking about like a, a thing that went on my entire senior year in high school. The politics ended up resulting in me losing um, my basketball scholarship and the school telling me that like they wanted me to sit out a whole year. And if I matriculated, any, if I took classes anywhere that they weren't going to honor the classes and if I matriculated at another school, like they would consider that um, voiding my acceptance. And so. My family, particularly my mother at the time, shout out to black moms. My mom was like, word? All right, yeah, fuck that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> we had gone to, um, I, you know, because I went to, to private school, I went to school with a, a fair amount, like the, the black kids who did go to my school, they were some heavy hitters. Um, you know, they, they were some heavy hitters and their families had connection. So I had a friend of mine who I had known since like sixth grade, he was in sixth grade, I was in seventh grade, whose um, family friend was being courted by, he's, he's a big time business businessman. His family friend was being courted by uh, the board of trustees for Howard Hampton and Morehouse. And they had been following my situation for a while, like they knew what was going on. And they talked to their peoples and their people said, all right, you know what? I just got, I just had dinner and an invitation to be on the board of trustees at all of these schools. Why don't you um, apply? Now, mind you, this is, and this is why the story is so wild. This is August of 20, I mean, this is August of 1997. When I say August, I mean like August 6th. I'm supposed to be on campus like within days. Within days, right. that's why the story is so and wild. And it's HBCU, so right, you know, right. You I never just know. Got my acceptance letter to Howard, like two. Years, <laughs> right, right, right. So it's August sixth. I send out the application. No, no, no. I sent out the. I think it was like August third or fourth when I sent out the applications. August sixth, I get a. Um, I mean, August sixth, I get a call from a woman who's working in the office of the president. She, uh, she now works in alumni affairs, Karen House. She was special assistant to, uh, to President Swagger. And she's like, you know, I'm at, I'm at my, my internship at my job. I had an internship that summer. And she was like, um, hello, can I speak to Charles Coleman? I said, this is he. She said, hi, my name is Karen House. I'm calling from the president's office at Howard University. And like my, my, my spirit just lit up. She's like, I'd like to welcome you to the Bison family. I was like, damn, that's crazy. Wild, right? They were the first, they were, I got into all three, but they were the first people to call. They actually called. Everybody else sent a letter. They called. They had a scholarship. They put me in Drew Hall. I was like, yo, I'm, that's it. That's it. That was it for me. That's crazy, man. You know what? Wow. <laughs> and, that, and by the way, that was less than a week before the pinning ceremony. Like, that was six days. Yo. Before the pinning ceremony, and little, little did you know, when you that got to Howard, it was, fact. That was that, it was that was it was about to change your life, man. That's a fact. You arrive on the Mecca, freshman orientation, pinning ceremony, like 
What goes no. through the mentality? Because you are you a certified killer. You more like a sniper though, because you like to lay in the back. And then next thing I know, I look up, you in charge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What was it like for you to it, to be in that environment? It was it was you know Josh. It was uh, interesting to me because I obviously I definitely knew about Howard University, but I hadn't toured there. I hadn't gone to college tour there. I, you know, and I and then also. Unfortunately, people, what I was hearing at that time, you know, Howard had some challenges in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and that was just a reflection of like where we were as a community. As you know, Howard is in DC. Um, and so DC had a huge problem with like violent crime. They had a problem with drugs and things of that nature. And so a lot of people who don't know about Howard for real, for real, during that time period were, they're, they're, they're image of the school was tainted by some of the bad press that was going on in DC. So at first people were kind of sort of like, Oh, well, you know, you got to be careful because you know, it's DC, DC is wild, what have you. But I also knew a lot of people from New York um, went to Howard. What was wild was when I got, I thought I knew mad people. When I got to Howard, I'll never forget this. You know how you have the, the um, you got to take your class picture on, on the football field? Yeah. At, well, well, in the football stadium? I remember, you know what I'm saying, going out there and being like, all right, let me walk through this line real quick, acting like I'm trying to find, you know, some way to, to get into the line. But what I'm really doing is I'm just looking for someone who I know from my childhood or from grade school that I could just at least sound and be like, oh, yeah, I know you. Okay, cool, now I'm good. Because I didn't go to Howard with any friends or anything like that. I remember walking through that line, and I saw nobody. And I, it was, I, I was bugged out by that. I was like, I saw <laughs> not a single person that I knew. And you saw, I was that, like, you saw that six to one, though. That seven I saw that, though. <laughs> I saw that, though. I said, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I definitely saw that. Um, and I just realized that, like, yo, this was a type of environment that I had to get acclimated to real fast. But it took, it took, you know, it didn't take no time. But I will say that the people who helped me figure the six to one out, those were the OGs in the game. Those were the shout out, shout out Benny LeBron, um, <laughs> my, my man Benny, uh, you know, shout out Steve Albao. Uh, a bunch of the the, the facts, the, the 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 folks from up New York, uh, up that way, Smyrtle, uh, Karan, Swift, all of them. Those are my people. But you know, I think that we went to Howard in one of the best eras. It was organic. Um, it was fun. It was yeah. That that nineties era was crazy when you think about the talent that was at at Howard in that nineties uh, span, man. Because I've had Ooh. some guests, whether it was Eric Roberson or. You know, Tracy Lee, I had Chris Tyson, you know, just thinking about and they tell them about like talking about what their classmates are up to and what their classmates are doing now. Yo, like Shy, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, uh, what's the actor name uh, from uh, Wakanda, Chadwick Boseman, Shy. Taraji, like just thinking yeah, about. I, man, I, I'm sure you've had, I'm sure you've had Lance on. Yeah, I had Lance on the show. Like, I mean, you know, 90s was a dope ass time. I mean, it I caught the tail end. I came in in '99, but, but yeah, man. I mean, Howard was man. It was experience like no other. Yeah, but I mean, but even even if you look at early 2000s, right? Like, even if you look at what's going on now in the space in early 2000s, you know, it's a lot of us that are still out there because I'm, you know, I graduated in '01, so I like literally sat on both sides, the end of the '90s and the beginning of the 2000s, right? Like, if you look at the folks who are doing their thing now across the country, affecting change for people, it's nuts. Like Brandon Neal, um, you know, Justin Tanner, uh, yeah, Charm Stephanie, Char Brown. Stephanie Brown, you yeah. know, Charmian, uh, you know, Brittany Cooper. Uh, you look up, you know, Russell Drake, like it's, it's nuts. Like you're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. and it's not a surprise. Like, you know right. what I'm saying? And like, I got dirt on all of them. <laughs> Right, right. That's a fact. <laughs> That's a fact, right? So, like, whether it's like, you know, like, yeah, I remember you from Five Sig, or I remember mm -hmm. you from this or that, or I remember you from Gabe's Pals, or, you know, like, you, it's, 
it, it's, it's nuts. And I always tell people, people be like, did every, damn, did everybody go to Howard? I'd be like, nah, just the special ones. You know so as a, as, a, as a two-time Howard graduate, as a two-time trustee, as a academic, as a savage, as just a well-rounded brother, like what was it like to sit on, to sit on both sides? You know, were you as a student, you doing your thing, you having that complete student experience while into being doing the thing in the grades, but then you're a trustee as well. You know what I'm saying? You buttoning it up. Yeah. The, like, what was that like? That's that's where you get that's where you get big headed Charles from. That's where that's where <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. Like, you um, walk into the means like you you guys don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what I will say to the benefit of students. Um, because I was a student trustee, I was a trustee, but I was there primarily to represent the undergraduate trust, the undergraduate students, and then the graduate students. What I will say is that I was too green to even realize, like, that I didn't have, uh, you know, the same like voice as everybody else. So I just walked in the room, was like, yeah. So nah, we don't want it to. We want a tuition freeze, and then we got it right, like. So it contributed, my ignorance at the time contributed to my boldness. Like it was, but it was wild. But, it, but I'll tell you this though, in terms of life and future experience, it always allowed me to speak truth to power. Because uh, when you're in a room with, you know, literally global leaders, um, you know, you're in a room with Vernon Jordan, you're in a room with Kenneth Lay, you're in a room with Jack Kemp. You're in a room with Colin Powell. Like, I'm sitting eight feet away from Colin Powell. Like, Colin, right? how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, General Powell, how are you? How are you, sir? I'm good, young man. How are you? You're like, oh, shit. Yeah. So, it's, it's, so, since that time, I've, it was huge for me because it was like, you know, it bust my head wide open, but it also made me feel like there's no room that I don't belong in. And if I get into the room, I have every right to speak my voice as anyone else. That was huge because I was like, you know, yeah, I've been in some rooms with some bigger people, if you will, but never like across the board, that type of combination. Yeah. And so because of that, I'm like, man, y'all ain't throwing nothing at me that I ain't never seen before and I'm ready for it. But at the time, and, you know, as a 20-year-old, as a 21-year-old, it's like, yo, you know, it, it's, 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 it's awe-inspiring. It you have, you you have any regrets, man, from mom? Um, like, things you wish you would have did or not did at Howard? I think, like I said, I think the only regret that I have is uh, I probably, um, I, I think the only regret that I have is I probably would have... <clears throat> uh, not had such a big ego. That's probably it. Just been a little bit more humble, more humble man. A little bit more humble and just sort of let that come. But that's you know that's youth, and you know those are lessons you have to learn. But other than that, There's a lot of cats at Howard though with big egos, man. Some of the cats, yeah, some of the names you just named, Brandon Neal. Oh yeah, God, Lord, Lord have mercy. You you think of the, think <laughs> the personalities like when you look back, you like yo that cats really was you know what I'm saying was on that. So, yeah, there's really on it. So, you know, you, you, it, it was also survival. So, you know, yeah. that is really good. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of had to have that, man. So, yeah, you know, that's probably my only regret. I, everything else, like, you know, there may be things that I might have done different, maybe. But, like, I think, ultimately, those are learning experiences that made me who I am. What about you? Do you ever have any, any regrets about your, your time at Howard? Yeah, I think I, I I came out in four years. I think I would have did five. You know, that's one thing I regret. I think I would have took a moment. You know, being a campus pal and coming in as a freshman, you never wanted to miss an orientation, obviously. Yeah, and yeah. you never wanted to miss that. I would have studied abroad. That's something I regret. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, I think um, I would have pledged at Howard. Um, that was something that, again, being a pal, and this – comes to being at Howard and just having so much fun and doing stuff, <clears throat> I, I didn't really want to miss stuff. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Like, why do I need to do that? I'm popular. Like, I'm, you yeah. know, I wasn't really thinking on the long term, you know, and of course I would have uh, been more intentional about having relationships with, uh, 
with with people, man. I kind of got my three, four friends, and I was just like, you know what, I'm I'm good, man. But yeah, yeah, you know, everything happens for a reason, man. I mean, what absolutely? Is, what about you? Same thing. I mean, you know, for me, um, I think. I did want to do it at Howard. There's no question about the, the, you know, wanting to do it at Howard. You know, it didn't happen. It doesn't happen for everybody. My sophomore year, um, there wasn't a line. My junior year was 2000. Um, I didn't make that line. And then, like, the last year, you know, there was an opportunity. But the last year there was an opportunity. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I was also thinking about law school and trying to graduate. And I was like really focused on trying to do it in four. I was trying to do it in four. I was trying to graduate. And I really felt like as a senior, I was putting that in jeopardy. And I knew that nobody in my family was going to be okay with me. Like you say, you should, you know, you, you, you would have like, you might've done five. I wouldn't have minded doing five, but I know my family just, you know, most people in my family conceptually think of college as like, oh, it's a four year experience, like four years and it's over. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think if I had done five, my family probably would have been like, what is, why, why, what's going on? Why, why you got to take five years? It's four years. Why, why are you doing five? Mm -hmm. You know, so that way, especially, and especially if like, even if this wasn't the case, if they thought me becoming a Q, had something to do with like, yo, this is why you couldn't graduate in four years. It would just have been a whole thing. So like my senior year in 01, shout out to 2000, shout out to the, to the, to the 01 line. Both of those lines are good lines. Um, I, I really had to make that decision and I kind of fell back. You know, like the opportunity was like there, but I kind of like fell back, you know, cause I was like, oh shit, if I, yeah. you know, I'm trying to graduate, you know, but I wasn't even thinking. I was like, oh, I'm a pal. I'm not about to <laughs> I want to reap every benefit of being on the yard, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, like my yeah. mind was like, I'm not sacrificing. And, yeah. Nothing. And, and, <laughs> and I also, I also, you know, and that's the other thing. I also just had a lot of I had my, my I had a lot of pots on the stove yeah. at the same time. I was a trustee, I was doing other things and like in a in a in a in a positive way, you know, I was popping. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like I was popping and I was good with it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like I was really good with it. So that was that was cool, you know. But, you know yeah, I think one of the things, man, is that uh I wish that I just knew more about that life and, and all of that stuff before I got to Howard so I could have an understanding. But I wish I would have yeah. more about Howard too. Cause when you graduate, yeah. that's kind of when you learn like, damn, all these organizations were started here or damn, this person went to Howard. This is what Drew yeah. Hall means. Cause yeah. you learn about it, but you're not really, you learn about it's it. It's there. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't, like it's, like, like it's wild because it's, it's, it's all this history, like literally right in your face. And yeah. you be like, oh yeah, you know, Drew Hall. Oh, <laughs> Douglas Hall. you like, Yes, yeah, Douglas Hall. Frederick Douglass actually taught there. <laughs> right, right. right. Lock, Lock Hall, like Elaine Locke actually taught there. you like, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. You know, right. So, Alpha chapter, like, they yeah. started here. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. You're it's not really thinking one. that as a right student. Here. Yeah, so, yeah. like, I didn't really have that perspective. I was more so like, man, I'm at Howard. I'm, I'm just taking it one day at a time. It wasn't no long-term thinking. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. I want to ask, man, I know you're short on time, but um, advice, bro. Like, what, what type of, like, what, what advice do you have for the 18-year-old Charles Coleman this coming into Howard, man, this, this cat is feeling this stuff. This dude is ambitious, man. He's going to be a, a yeah. kid. He's going to be a trustee. He's going to be yeah. in this organization. He's going he's gonna to be with Beyonce. This yeah, cat, yeah, cat, yeah. <laughs> this cat is a monster, man, but he's taking care of business. He wants to. And then yeah. after that, he wants to go on in a, and, and be great. Like, what, what advice do you have for that dude? Um, know who you are. Like, know who you are. And 
if you are true and authentic to who you are, you don't have to prove anything to anyone because it'll all be evident. Know who you are, be true to that. There's no need to um, force it. Just let it come to you. Enjoy it all. Enjoy it all, but let it come to you. You know what I'm saying? The best position in any room is not the center. It's one of the corners because you can see the rest of the room and everything that's going on without having to watch your own back. And um, sort of learning how to walk into a room and stand in the corner with your back to the wall and assess what's going on before you actually step into the center. Even if eventually you do step into the center, it can mean a lot and it can do a lot of different things. So understanding that, um, and like I said, just being true and authentic and honoring who you are as a person is a very big deal uh, and goes very, very far. Um, and I think honoring that is like everything as far as I'm concerned. So just, yo, like know who you are, young blood, and, 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 and just be that and you'll be fine and everything will be fine. What are some, uh, what, what you got going on right now, man? I know you got your hand in a lot of stuff. Yeah, man. So, um, I have, uh, a couple projects I'd love to, you know, plug real quick. Number one, I have my first and, 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 and oldest nonprofit edge movement, New York city, which is a mentoring program for young black boys that I run. I think I called you about, this was years ago. I think I called you when I was first starting it. Cause I asked you when you were doing, um, swish, uh, I asked you about like, yo, you know, the ups and downs of you know, your program, how to get it started, the things to be mindful of. And I remember you gave me some game some years ago to help that get off the ground. So, um, shout out to swish dreams Academy. Um, I still have edge going, which I'm thankful for. Also have a different nonprofit CFC 40 CFC 40. Uh, was something that I founded last year, uh, and that was um, our initial project there was the Black Superhero Project. And what we did there was we went to 10 different cities across the country and did 10 different service acts and communities of color. Wanted to get to Chicago, couldn't make it in terms of how we worked, worked it out. Chicago was originally one of the, the 10 planned cities, but it just, you know, we just weren't able to. Let me know, man. I'm a... Uh... I would love to. I would love to. Yeah, we but we love to collaborate. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in a few organizations here, man. I'm in. A of course, you are. Man. Obviously, I'm an alpha. Um, I'm a, uh, in the Chicago Druids. You know, okay. we always have uh, dynamic folks. So, man, if you, you that that dude. You that yeah, dude. So, yeah, I would love to love to have you, man. Now you a celebrity, so you yeah. Know, if we can afford you, bro, you know, well, what I'm you know <laughs> I, I do. I do charge. I ain't gonna lie about that. <laughs> Uh, Black Brilliance is a brand, blackbrilliance.net. Like, that's what we do. We promote Black Brilliance and uh, narratives around Black Brilliance. And then finally, Black Brilliance 360, which is a web series created by myself and my executive producer, Tamisha Harris. Shout out to Tamisha. Um, we wanted to display as many different uh, narratives around Black manhood that we could. Uh, we have another bison on the show, Stefan Senegal, one of the Alpha Chapter Bros. I'm glad to have him on um, on the cast. And, you know, we have another a, a few other HBCU alums, but just not, you know, they, everybody can't go to Howard, unfortunately. <laughs> um, that's on YouTube and on social media, Black Brilliance 360. Number one, like, how does it feel to, to, to walk the streets, man, and get stopped? Like, yo, I seen you on such a, or I, I read your... You know what I'm saying? Like, how how does that feel? It's uh, it's I, you know I ain't gonna front. It's cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not gonna lie to you and be like, oh, that shit is <laughs> whack. I'm tired of it. Like, it, it's it, it's definitely cool, right? But it bugs me out because social media is a real weird space, right? Because you you know if 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 you go if I was to go to Howard right now and give a talk at Crampton. I can look out and see how many people were there. I can see who was there. I know all of that, right? So I have a general sense, well, verbal I'm again, I perform. I know who was in the audience. So I have a general sense of like who checked me out and who did it and whatever, whatever. 
But with social media and TV, you literally never know who's watching or how many people are watching. You have no idea. And so it always bugs me out when people are like, yeah, I know who you are. And I'm like, huh? How? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I see you. I watch you on CNN all the time. And I'm, like, I'm not the biggest Twitter person. I have a very big following on Facebook, a huge following on Facebook. It, like, it, how, it, how does that feel? Like, is that something that you think about? Like, yo, if I say something, like, people are going to run with it. So I got to yeah, really be yeah. on it. You know what I'm saying? It absolutely changes what I say. Well, not even what I say, how I say it, what I choose to speak on, what I don't, how I choose to approach topics. Because you're right. Like, it's a platform, but I learned, I learned really quickly that you have to use it responsibly. Like you don't have the space to just be you. Like you have to actually, you know what I'm saying, consider how this is going to impact or be viewed or how other people are going to see it and respond to it before you open your mouth. You a guy that likes to have fun, you yeah, know what I'm man. saying? Like yeah, how man. how is that like when you like damn, you know, people it, can distinguish between the two cuz even they can't. And so, no. oh, this nigga was. Yeah, he was. That's the thing. So, you know, you hear rappers talk about it all the time. Like Drake, he like Drake's made like a whole career about like how his life is different now. No one. The the, the issue for me was like no one ever taps you on the shoulder and is like, "Yo, you're here now. Now you got to move different." You oftentimes learn because some shit happens that you didn't think would happen or expect to happen, and it blows up in a way that you never expected. And then from that point on, you're like, damn, I really do got to move different. Like, this, I, I guess I'm at that point. Because you don't see yourself that way. And so for me, it's made me much more humble, much more recluse. Uh, I have my, my core. I won't, say I'm not, I'm not, I won't say no new friends, but I have my core crew of friends and folks that like they're like my family i kind of fuck with them and we do what we do off camera and we have a great time and we enjoy ourselves and that's pretty much it but like the hot spot spots you won't see me in i'll, I'll come through for a quick 45 what's good hey I, hey it is <laughs> and then i'm out because it, it, it it's different people people will use that as a yeah you know i saw even if i wasn't there right like People say, oh, I saw Charles. He was there raggedy. What? Yeah. Every what? time I see you at homecoming, bro, it's like five minutes. I'm like, yo, he just was. <laughs> he was just. <laughs> he, was he was just right here. here. He was just right here. Yeah, so shit. real quick, like a lot, a lot of times, you know, when we think about a, a person that's a prosecutor, immediately we say, man, this person is putting black people behind bars. You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the thing that came. You know, when Kamala was running for yep. president, it was like, oh, we got some, you put, you know, you was putting people with smoking marijuana and you put all these dudes in prison and you now you go on a breakfast club. That's and what we say. You was putting niggas in jail. That's what we say. Yeah. What we say. I mean, prosecutor, man. I mean, obviously this is something that I wanted to ask you, man. I mean, being a, a prosecutor, being a black man that's a prosecutor, you from Brooklyn, you go back to Brooklyn as a prosecutor. What is that like, you know, and for folks that, because I remember I posted something about Kamala and it was like, I'm thinking it's about to get love. Niggas went in like she did, you know, boom, 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 boom. Like, yeah, they, they was not, what is it like to be a black man. prosecutor, man? And you are charged with putting folks away that it looked like you. I mean, what? That's, you know, a, great you, that's a great question. That. Um, being a black prosecutor, I found is a constant reevaluation and recalibration of what I like to call your moral compass. Um, meaning that on one hand, you understand the need and the value and the importance of uh, us as black people having access to safe communities. But on the other hand, um, you also know that in a lot of cases, what you are seeing are the manifestations of systemic oppression. And in most cases, many of these people committed no crime other than being born poor. So you're constantly sort of evaluating this within the context of a very broken system. And I mean, you know, to be honest with you, once I realized the political nature of what it is to be a prosecutor, once I saw 
um, how it worked, and I, 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 you know, I saw the ways in which the system was broken. I couldn't ignore it anymore, and that's ultimately why I left and went into civil rights. Um, I respect prosecutors, uh, particularly black prosecutors. We, we, we need black prosecutors. There's no question about it. We need black prosecutors. But I think you hit on an important point, and that is, um, you know, with respect to Kamala Harris and her uh, previous run for president, I think the thing that we have to be aware of, that we have to remember and be mindful of is like, there's an important conversation that needs to be had about violence, safety, communities of color and police. We have to be able to, to balance and figure out a conversation that has some balance around our need and deservingness of safe communities without having to be over-policed by law enforcement, right? But also sort of like in a space that allows us to uh, thrive and be good, right? So like now, like you're a young man, you're from Chicago, you're back in Chicago, right? Like there are a lot of things that are competing, so to speak, with one another. You're a young black man, you don't want to necessarily be um, in a position where like police are targeting you and or you're treated unfairly by the system. At the same time, you're also a father. So you want to make sure that you're in a space where your children are safe, in a, in a community that your children are safe, right? And that shouldn't have to mean moving out on your own. Um, at the same time, you're also a Chicago native. So you're very, very in tune to some of the challenges that have been faced but in Chicago with respect to, you know, its history with gang activity, its history with proximity killings, its history with gun violence and things like that. State of hip hop, man. Like, like first, before we, before I ask you about the state of hip hop, give me your, your top five MCs so that the man, people I can just, know, like, how you going to answer this next question? I just had this conversation, man. Um, I was born and raised in Queens and Brooklyn, so oh, don't give me all New York. My first two, no, I'm not, not, not giving me all New York. No, 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 no. Definitely not giving me all New York people. Um, so my first two have to be Nas and Jay. Uh, Nas and Jay get my first two spots. Um, to be honest with you, the Jay, the the Nas spot is is unquestionable. I'm giving Jay the second spot, but that, to be honest with you, could be a lot of people from New York. That could be LL. It could be Big Daddy Kane. It could be Rakim. It could be any of those people. But I'm, I'm just going to say Jay, right? It would be somebody from New York. No list, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, no list of anybody's top MCs that does not have 3,000 on it is credible. As far as I'm concerned, I feel no, like. But what about the argument when Cass said, "Well, he was in a group, or he don't really drop singles like that, or yeah, I mean, albums so I, like I, that." I just, I just had that conversation, right? Like, so it depends on you know, like the measure, like how are you measuring MCs, right? Like, I don't, I don't really know what the measure is. I just feel like we know what he's capable of, right? Um, you know. I'm I'm saying this because you're you're in Chicago and you're from Chicago, but it, it's really how I feel. I wish I wish Ye wrote more of his stuff because then I could give Ye Ye a little bit more credit. Because I I'm not gonna lie, I love Ye as an MC. Mm -hmm. I love Ye as an MC, but he doesn't write his own shit, and so it's like I don't know what's Ye and what's not. So I kind of sort of take that back, right? Now moving on. So I I, I do put three thousand. I realize his body of work is like, in terms of like completion, not all the way there. But I do love 3,000. Um, not New York cat, but you'll probably still take it, take it away because it's definitely East Coast. Tariq Trotter, Black Thought, got to give, got to give, I got it. Wow, Black Thought is nice, man. I mean, yeah. the roots, the roots. I mean, because he's part of a group too. Yeah, he is. He's part of a band. Know. And so he's on my top five. And then it's interesting that you say that because like, my fifth is, is very much so a dark horse. It's, it's unpopular, but that's still, I still love him. 
uh, I got to go with the gentleman out of Do- Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Fonte Jake Coleman? Coleman. No, Fonte Coleman from Little Brother. Fonte. Oh, man, yeah, you old, man. Damn. Yeah, Fonte is, Fonte is from Little Brother is like, like that dude is nuts. Oh, I got I to gotta listen to him, man, because I'm not yeah. really in tone like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fonte is, is a problem. He's a problem. Um, you know, and I like, so, you know, with the state of hip hop, there are other artists I like, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I like, uh, you know, of course, I don't even look at J. Cole and Kendrick and, or, or um, J. Electronica as like new because they're not like to me. Um, when I think of like new kids, so here's the thing. I think we try too much. We were talking earlier about boxes and like how people try to put you on boxes. I think we try too much with like hip hop to put hip hop artists in certain boxes because it, it helps us feel better about classifying things. We like to classify shit. I think the mistake that we make about current hip hop is that we want, we, we try to put it in the box of what hip hop is or rap music is in terms of what we expect it to sound like. And so like we a lot of times don't like it, but if you allow it to grow into something different, that's maybe not rap music traditional, so to speak, but like, like rap music is over 30, rap music is 40 years old. It's 40 years old. Rap music is literally as old as I am. So it makes sense that like, it's time to evolve the categories within rap music that we look at and, and to, to look at hip hop as, Potentially mm-hmm. having other new categories, right? Whether that's <clears throat> mumble rap, whether that's some yeah. other shit that we ain't really thought of, whether it's the sing songy, whatever it is, mumble rap. right? Like whatever that is, like we we have to create space that recognizes that, like, yo, this is not traditional rap music, mm-hmm. but you know, it is what it is. I used I I, I like Roddy Rich, I like YBN Corday, um, you know. NBA, no, so who who you listening to right now? I, I'm traditional hip hop, so <clears throat> right now I'm listening to that new Run the Jewels album, um, that that Run the Jewels four with Killer Mike. Um, you know, I, I love that album. That's a good record. Is it? Also, let me ask you this: Is it any MCs that you used to listen to? Like, used to swear by? Like, I just these, this group is so, or these people are so cold. This artist is so cold. That now you listen to like man, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, because I I tell you, man, like I used to love Wu Tang, dog, and I promise I listen to their stuff now. I was like, ah, I was never a huge Wu. I'll be just as unpopular as this may be to say, I was never like a overwhelmingly like crazy Wu Tang fan. I wasn't a huge Wu Tang fan. What I will say is that like. It may not have been as popular in Chicago, but like a lot of the um, boot camp clip, like uh, Helter Skelter, mm-hmm. um, Black Moon. I don't really know that like their stuff has aged very well. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like very dated for like the time period when it was popping, but it's not like the shit that like ages like super well, in my opinion. Like that's just an example. Um, yeah, some stuff just didn't age well uh it's not like timeless like that uh even though he's in my top five like even though two of them are in my top five you know um i don't know that like current day jay is like what i want to hear like i don't like i think his career is like amazing but i don't necessarily like know that i want to hear current day jay and the shit he's talking about and even nas like Y'all niggas sound like old niggas who got divorced or had women problems in your marriages and shit and are going through midlife crises. Like, that's not, I mean, that's, that's where you at in life, so it's authentic, but, like, that's not really, like, hip-hop party music that I want to listen to, my guy. And, and you know what else, Um, with everything that's going on, I've really been listening to a lot of Tupac uh, mm. lately, man. I wasn't the biggest Tupac fan. Me either. When he, around the time he died, but if you go back and listen, it's like, damn, is this nigga out now? He was a fucking prophet. Yeah, yeah. like, 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 he took the his, words right out of my mouth, man. His understanding of, of shit was like, and you can't appreciate it in, in time because you ain't lived, you ain't lived it yet, but when you see that shit, you're like. Yeah, right, like he was at the time when I got put on to him because I was, 
you know, in 95, I was graduating eighth grade. <laughs> so, and I wasn't really, you know, when he was like, after, I was like, yo, this dude is just too angry. So I kind of grabbed it. I was the biggie. I was like, yo, this dude is, you know, smooth. Saying, right? he's smooth. He got bars. Tupac was just so angry. But now when you hear Tupac, I'm like, damn, this nigga was like ahead of his time. Like, how was you yes. rapping about this shit? And you like 24? Yeah. Oh, man. 24 years old. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. So I want to do Jeopardy real quick. And then right. we got um a little rapid fire, man. So Jeopardy is just seeing what you know about Howard, man. Just a oh, few gosh. questions. Okay. Easy stuff, man. You was a trustee, a pal. That's what niggas all that shit. So, think, right? so okay. you're gonna get all this stuff. So um first question, man. What year was Howard founded? 1867. Got it. What is the Howard motto? The Howard motto? Motto. You mean on the on the shield on the crest? Yeah, what's that? Oh, truth and service. Got it. How do you spell? No, I didn't know if he was talking about leadership for the global community and beyond. Like, you know, Swagger had had us. Yeah, uh, Swagger had some other shit. So that's why I was like, yeah, he brainwashed us with that one. Truth and service. Yeah. <laughs> uh, spell Crampton. Ha! Crampton does not have a P. It's C R A M T O N <laughs> Auditorium. There's no P in Crampton. Cool. Dope. Uh, finish this sentence. Reared against the eastern sky. Probably there on Hell's Top High. Yeah, you're going to get all these right. Um, I still know the, 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 the old motto. What's the black national anthem? Lift every voice and sing by James Weldon Johnson. You just <laughs> threw that in because you were alpha. It's all right, though. <laughs> um, what is the zip code of Howard? Oh, sheesh. I feel like I know the law school more than I know Howard. Uh, is it for some reason, like two two five nine one is coming to my head. I don't think that's right though. <laughs> two zero zero five nine. Two zero 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 five nine. Okay. Okay. You stayed in Drew, man. Where um, what's the address of Drew? <sighs> um, I want to say this: the the, the number is like four fifty nine. Well, you know us on Sherman. Yeah. For, no, is it 551 Sherman or four? It's like either 459 or 551 Sherman, I feel like. 511, oh my bad. 511 Gresham Place, my bad. Ah, Gresham Place. Gresham yeah, Place. 511 Gresham. Oh, oh think, man. Sherman is at the tower. I forgot. Sherman is, Sherman is, uh, I think Sherman is the tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's the president of Howard? Oh, um, uh, President, um, Fredericks, I'm trying to think of his first name though. Yeah, Wayne. Wayne, yeah, President Wayne Fredericks. Who is Howard Fred named Fredericks. after? General Oliver Otis Howard. Good stuff. All right, now here's rapid fire. All right. So rapid fire, you just got to give a response, no explanation. All yeah. right. Can't keep going. Um, uh, first one is U Street or Adams Morgan. U Street. Is homecoming better as an alum or as a student? Alum. <laughs> easy right easy uh, <laughs> black as fuck yes um best Howard moment ice cream social as a pal um Howard men don't cheat gospel <laughs> <laughs> you just lost all your credibility on CNN and all the money <laughs> As for you and your house, <laughs> you got to start one, cut one, and uh, bench one. Okay. Orientation, homecoming, graduation. You said, you, what was the first one? Orientation, you said? Yeah, so freshman orientation, homecoming, or graduation. Start one, bench one, cut one. Wow. Got to start homecoming. Um, got a bench graduation and got a cut orientation. It's a tough one, though. That's a really tough one. Um, make America great again. Never was the biggest L you ever took. <sighs> Losing to Chantrell when I ran against her for Arsenal Science president. Oh man, I remember that. 
It's funny. Yeah. That shit is crazy. That's a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was she a Delta then? She was not a Delta. She was oh, about to. I was about to say, you know you weren't going to win that one. Yeah, nah, she wasn't a Delta yet. Um, when, when did you first learn to say no? Shit. Long after Howard. Uh, probably when I became a man. That's when I, that's when I became a man. Uh, tailgate or yard fest? Damn. Um, shit. Tailgate. At least the way it was before they tried to, you yeah, know. So it's yeah. curtains for now. Um, yeah. The quad or the NX? NX. <laughs> Classy um, ladies, boy. When did you um, find your voice? At Howard University. At Howard University. You got to start one, bench one, or cut one. Love, Republic Gardens, or Park? Starting love. Well, hold on. Is love the same as dream? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, I know it is, but are we, are, for this question? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, yeah, starting love, uh, benching the park and cutting Republic. Yo, man, Charles, you've been a great guest, bro. My G, I appreciate you uh, like you don't know. Again, thank you so much for what you do for the culture. Thank you for having me. When I say that this was probably like the most uh, enjoyable podcast that I've done, you and Cam's, which is no no coincidence, my my campus pal, protégés that y'all came in and, you know, my Bison brothers. Um, it, yo, this is huge. I, I really enjoyed it. It's a great way to kick off my day. Um, thanks for getting up and doing it. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining the HU Move Maker podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.